There is another question about the story that I was uh, telling today about the farmer who lived near the Buddhist monastery, who was a, a pig farmer and used to slaughter the pigs. And they could hear the pigs squealing. And then I mentioned the, the, the Buddha said, you know, people asked him why he's doing that. He said, well, something to affect it. That's his karma, and you know he he can't be, uh, you know he, he won't change that in his life. Maybe he was already very old. Uh, and usually it is said that you know some people in this lifetime uh, are not ready to hear the Dhamma. And should be, you know. Uh, left to their ignorance. Now, do any of you know anybody in your family or friends who are non-believers in the Dhamma? Who don't care about the Dhamma? And are you going to leave them in their ignorance? You try to, uh, you know, uh, teach them? Some people's minds are so closed that uh, you'd exasperate yourself trying to change them. And if they're ready to change, they would change very quickly. Now, here's a story. There's another story in the text about a man named Angulimala. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard this story. How many have heard the story of Angulimala? So there was this person uh, who, in his young days, he was a very bright pupil, and he, you know, he was he was going to this school. He was very bright, and he, he was, uh, you know, outshone all the other disciples. Uh, but they were uh, jealous of him. I think they told the teacher that uh, this boy was having an affair with his wife, teacher's wife. And then the teacher, you know, got very angry. He was believing these other kids. And uh, <clears throat> so he, uh, you know, made it very difficult for that boy to uh, couldn't graduate from the school. Or, or no, he, yeah, in those days when you went to a school, you had to give a gift for the teacher when the uh, school was over, graduation time. You had to give a gift. You know, uh, and the teacher had to, you know, you had to obey the, the teachers. You know. He said, he told this young boy, so your gift, you must bring me a finger garland. That means a garland is like a flower necklace, garland. But with 100 fingers, although the story says a thousand, I don't think it's a thousand, but say a hundred, that's bad enough, right? So a hundred fingers from people he'd murdered and cut off the finger and then threaded it on a necklace and then you bring that to me. Uh, and he had to obey. And even though he was a good you know, a student before, he turned into this, uh, you know, uh, murderer. And he needed one more finger. Now all the all the, the people that lived in the whole county were enraged, and uh, you know they were you know scared and feared of this uh, guy. And even the king, you know, is putting out a reward for his, his capture. But nobody could capture him. They were afraid to go near him. And so he needed one more finger to complete the garden. And he thought, ah, oh, I'm going to get the finger of my mother. She won't resist. 
And then you know, every morning the Buddha used to survey the world with his divine eye and see who he could help, you know, who, who was on the wrong track and who he could help. So he saw that if Angulimala murdered his mother, he would he would be doomed to rebirth in hell for an eon of time. His killing a mother and father is said to be the most heinous kind of karmic crime anybody could ever do. So out of compassion for that murder, Angulimala, he appeared. Angulimala was you know, waiting in the bushes for his mother to come by. <clears throat> and then he saw the Buddha. He said, oh, maybe my mother won't come. I'll get the Buddha. <laughs> 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 uh, so he started running after the Buddha <laughs> with a sword. And the Buddha was just walking. And Angulimala was with, with, with his psychic power, he created this psychic power. That uh, even though Angulimala was running, the Buddha would, appeared to be walking slow, but he couldn't catch him. And then Angulimala said, Stop! Stop, you ascetic! Stop! And the Buddha said, Angulimala, I've already stopped. You stop. And that like shocked him, you know. No one ever spoke to him like that before. Let me stop. What do you mean? What do you mean you're stopped? You're still walking. And he said, I've stopped greed, hatred, and delusion in the mind. And that did something to Angulimala. And he, he got, you know, totally. He dropped to his knees, threw down his sword, got down on his knees and begged the Buddha's forgiveness. And the Buddha ordained him as a monk. And that person became a monk, who took him back to the monastery. And uh, because the Buddha saw that even though this person had he was forced into killing, basically. He was a good boy, a smart, very smart boy before he was forced to, to do that. So he saw the good qualities in Angulimala, despite him having killed 99 people, or 999, uh, that he had the potential for, you know, getting enlightenment. So he took him to the monastery, and then Angulimala went begging in the village, but people recognized him. And we're throwing stones and bricks at him, and he came back with a bloody head and and so on. And the Buddha told him, bear it up, Angulimala, bear it up. You know, this is the result of you're killing so many people, but this is a, hardly any kind of retribution for killing so many people. And then the king found out about it, that this uh, murder had become a monk. So he came to the Buddha. Of course, the king had profound respect for the Buddha. So he wasn't going to, you know, like criticize the Buddha. Or anything. But uh, so he came to the Buddha, but he didn't recognize uh, Angulimala. Or maybe he was sitting with the back to him. And the king came in and said, you know, do you have that uh, Angulimala here? And then the Buddha, without saying yes, he said, what do you think? Uh, king, because the king knew Dhamma, you know, he'd come to the Buddha and learn the Dhamma. Well, what would you say if a, if a person came and became a monk and gave up their former evil ways and now was living a, a good meditative life, uh, would you uh, invite that person for alms and pay them respect? And he said, yes. Of course, he didn't know Angulimala was there. <laughs> he said, yes. And then the Buddha turned and he said, uh, this is Angulimala. And the king's hair stood on him like that, but uh, he couldn't do anything about it. So anyway, I'm just telling this story uh, to uh, try to answer this, this question, that even though the Buddha didn't save the pig butcher, uh, he could save Angulimala because he recognized in Angulimala, he knew Angulimala's history, 
and being a young good boy and he was basically forced into these having to obey the teacher's uh, request of doing this although it seems quite <laughs> bizarre for you know, an average person but uh, evidently he didn't see such qualities in the pig farm. And the pig farmer might not go to hell for eon of time for butchering pigs, but killing the mother and father is a, a thousand times worse karmic punishment than killing pigs because there is a gradation in in the in the karmic consequences of, uh, for different classes of beings and so on. Anyway, that's hard for Westerners and the dollar equality and so on to uh, wrap their head around. As a leader of a workforce, it becomes very difficult to maintain mindfulness in the middle way, especially if your team are all in, are incompetent, and you have to fill in for all of them. How can one balance this? Uh, well, yeah, that's unfortunate. That's a, a very common uh, thing. And it even happens in some monasteries too. That uh, people take advantage of somebody who's kind and is very energetic and does a lot of work and they just want to, you know, sit back and just always sit in the meditation hall and meditate. Uh, rather than, uh, you know, sharing the uh, uh, the work. So, uh, well, maybe you need to do something that would inspire them to work. Or tell them to read the Buddhist Sutta on Kama Vipanga Sutta. How the lazy will be, you know, born in hell. I don't believe in it. Yeah, I mean, you know, those questions, uh, every situation is different, every group of people is different, basically, and uh, as a leader, uh, you know, you have to find ways to do that. Sometimes you can't, so uh, you get another job. I mean, I don't know. There's no miracles, miracle pills or miracle spells that uh, are going to, you know, make people change in their, in their habits. Is it wrong that I can't find compassion for certain political figures today? Uh, it's not necessarily wrong. Uh, you're not directly involved in those people. Just go to the ballot box. That's about all you can do. You know, if you don't like some person, you don't have compassion for them. You know, have compassion for their ignorance. These people, a lot of these people are ignorant. They're so conditioned and they're addicted to their narcissistic uh, idea of their, their intellect or their power or whatever. And, uh, you know, and, and you know, some people from their young days, they, they've been spoon fed and had everything given to them. They never worked hard in their life and expected just to, you know, get things from other people and and don't have to obey the rules, you know. So it's unfortunate there's so, so many people like that. So, you know, you don't have to have the compassion for the person himself, but have compassion for their, their ignorance. It's in the metta. And, uh, <clears throat> but in terms of the political thing, and especially in this, you know, current, the election, it's, it's, the power is going to be in the ballot box. 
And so if people don't like it, then they have to go to the ballot book. Mm -hmm. And then don't complain if they lost by one vote. What role does God play in Buddhism? What God? <laughs> it's Mahabrahma that I told the story about today. That's a Hindu God. Uh, it doesn't have any role to play necessarily. But there's God realms within the theory of uh, rebirth. If, if you saw that diagram, that artwork on the wall in there, it showed the six realms where it's possible to be reborn according to the Kama. And one of them is these uh, Deva and God type of realms, Deva realms. There's 16 of them. There's other Rupa Jhana Lokas with the, the radiant gods and all kinds of things like that. Brahma, also Maha Brahma. But it's a realm of rebirth and, and they. They're not a God who created the world. They're born there for certain types of, I guess, good karma, and the lifespan is very long. But they, when their karma is is uh, expiated, when they, you know, have stayed there long enough according to the karma, they you have to come back and be born again. Uh, I mean, you, you may or may not believe that, but. Uh, so these gods uh, that really don't have any important role in Buddhism, except to you know go learn from the Buddha, as Mahabrabha did. <clears throat> Told him to go learn from the Buddha. Now I don't want to you know step on anybody's religious toes by you know making that kind of a comment, but you ask me what role it has in Buddhism. Doesn't really have much of a role. May have a role in a religion, other religions, so be it. The precept of not to kill. Actually, you know, all the precepts are worded as training rule, not some set in stone absolute rule that, you know, if you break it, you're going to go to hell. But they're training rules to make us more mindful. And then we have to train. You're not going to be perfect in following those precepts all of a sudden. You know, take may years and years and years, but you train yourself to gradually, you know, stop killing, you know, big things and, you know, we're not deliberately and this and this and that in so many situations or, you know, telling lies or any other in the precepts. Usually you can't just stop them, you know, cold turkey all at once, as some people might. But uh, <clears throat> even myself, for example, when I took my first meditation course in Nepal, we had to take these uh, precepts, uh, eight precepts about not eating at night and also and about not killing. Uh, and then at the end of the retreat, we were given the opportunity to take five precepts that you should. But they said, uh, you can choose two or three. <laughs> if you don't think you can keep the precept, just take two or three. So out of the five precepts, I knew I wouldn't want to kill anything deliberately, but I didn't know about the intoxicating drugs or the sexual misconduct because I still wasn't a monk then, and you know, traveling as a hippie and all kind of <laughs> these things going on. Uh, so uh, I just took those three, but I knew I didn't want to kill anything. I didn't know I want to. Uh, oh, and also telling a lie because in India you have to tell some little <laughs> lies to get by you know, sometimes. To the immigration or to the police or something like that. So, you know, I just took a couple at that time. But then, <laughs> then when I felt I was ready to take all of them, you know, to go.
or whatever they came a month later. Anyway, this is a question that always comes up about the pests and insects, and especially if you have a garden. And basically, you have to make a decision. You have to follow the middle path. And if you understand the gradation of karma that I just mentioned a little while ago, the worst type of a killing is killing a, a human being. And the worst type of human being to kill is a mother or father, or a Buddha or an Arhat. Then it goes down to the bigger animals, like if you kill an elephant, it's worse than killing a dog. Or it goes all the way down. So insects, ants and insects should probably be at the lowest totem, the lowest bottom of the totem in terms of the karmic effect. Unless you, you know, did it maybe every single day and did it without any kind of any, uh, you know, you know, compassion or something. But sometimes there might be a time when you have to, you know, exterminate the, some insects in your house or it's causing, you know, harm and so on. And just take the consequences. You're not going to go to hell for breaking a precept. These are training rules. At least not a lot of them. And if you do it with, you know, compassion as a kind of a last resort, you try other things perhaps. And, uh, but you're the one that it has to eventually, you know, you have to make that decision. But you have to be prepared. If there's consequences, you have to be prepared. If something happens, don't blame somebody else. Where is the outdoor meditation, please? At Bhavan. You're referring to that place I mentioned yesterday. I think I mentioned we had a, there's a peace pole, and it's straight out that way. You cross the Nirvana Bridge, and you go down toward the parking lot down below. And it's about halfway down to the parking lot, although it's been all overgrown with bushes and trees, and maybe it's that way. Yeah. And uh, it's overgrown, so you may not be unless you kind of walk up close to it. You may not see it. But there's a peace pole. It's a it's a octagonal or hexagonal uh, stone granite thing about six feet high in the ground, and it's surrounded by a gravel, a round gravel kind of boundary. And uh, we used to meditate out there outside, but it's kind of gone to rack and ruin because it, <laughs> it hasn't been upkeep. So anyway, but it's there. And uh, you could go out there to sit if, if you wanted to. I mean, you can still go out there and sit, but you need some kind of a pad to put down on the on the on the gravel rocks that are there. Back in the day, we we used to have these uh, Thai umbrella cloth that has a mosquito net hanging from an umbrella that comes all the way down the ground. So we had uh, wooden things like this, you could hang the umbrella on, and then you could sit under the mosquito net and get the cool breeze, but not be uh, protected, protected from the mosquitoes. This seems like an evil game where we have to suffer through the matrix. Is this depicted in the Mara picture outside of the meditation hall, samsara? And finding a way out sucks. No, it hasn't sucked. Perfect. No one else can explain it better than the Buddha. <clears throat> is it basically it's a depiction of the Paticca Samuppada? 
you're referring to that artwork that I've already mentioned a few times, I guess. Uh, and there, in the very center of that diagram, there's a little, you know, a figure of a pig, a snake, and a rooster. And they, they're in the very center of the hub that are driving, turning the wheel. And those represent, the pig represents ignorance and the idea of this wallowing in the mud and filth, <laughs> you know, kind of, anyway, that's, that's how they define it. So the pig represents ignorance. The snake represents hatred. I don't know why they, how they came up with those things, but uh, snakes don't really hate people. They just defend them <laughs> or try to protect themselves. But anyway, and the chicken rep represents greed, because chickens are always going around. <laughs> anyway, whoever came up with that, I don't know, but that's the symbology. Of it. And then there's a downward path and the upward path. The upward path shows a like a, a monk ascending to heaven and then becoming a Buddha sitting out on the outside of the of the wheel. And it's a very, you know, it's a whole meditation in itself. And then the outside is the 12 links of dependent origination. Inside that are the six realms where people are reborn. And each of those links has a little picture. Like I mentioned, ignorance is depicted by a blind person with a key, you know, trying to walk. Um, There's a saying, difficult is the way for people who pick and choose. When our mind is always picking and choosing according to our likes or dislikes and, and wants and so on, then the path is difficult. That's why I like practicing the Dhamma, it takes a kind of like surrendering. Like when we bow, it's kind of surrendering. Now we're surrendering to a person. It's called the Buddha, but surrendering to that ideal of uh, human perfection or the ideal of, of total mental freedom. And what are we surrendering? Your ego. That's why, you know, a lot of Westerners, you know, they they pride themselves and be very intellectual. I'm not gonna bow to you know some jungle bunny who lived two thousand years ago. You know, I've heard that before. You know, their pride and their arrogance, you know, whatever their knowledge might have. You know, they, you know, so that's preventing them from learning. You can't learn with the the mind that's like these people that don't want to learn dumb. You know, you know, their egos are too prideful. Or they've invested so much energy in their life, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of being ignorant. Now they got to admit that they were ignorant. Now they want to lose. So they try to convince other people to follow them. So the more people that follow the ignorant, then they think it's normal. And they think that people like us are, are aberration. Of course, maybe it's true. <laughs> Pleasure, pain, and neutral. Is neutral a way to Nibbana? Well, neutral is probably not the best term to use. Uh, it's equanimity. And uh, neutral means you just don't want to uh, take side. But it's based from an ignorant point of view, not wisdom for the most part. You just want to get involved. I'll be neutral. Uh, but equanimity is, is uh, actually a purification of the mind. It's one of the highest purified states of mind. 
short of enlightenment, is equanimity. It's called even-mindedness. The mind is not going out in any direction, but it's based on wisdom, not on just, uh, uh, you know, taking some morphine and not caring about anything and not feeling any pain. And so. But yeah, there's a term in the practice of vipassana. There's something called the seven purifications and the eight stage eight stages of insight. And one of the last stages of insight is the stage just before attaining stream entry. And that state is called sankara upekka, which means the equanimity of the mental formations. The mental formations that are no longer picking, choosing or, uh, you know, not going in any direction. They're, they're just in the middle. But based on wisdom, seeing the emptiness of all the phenomena. And if you're interested, I was actually covering that topic in the last two Zoom programs that I do on Wednesday nights. Uh, tomorrow night, actually, you know, Wednesday, <laughs> the after tomorrow, I'll be finishing that topic on the, the last of the insight knowledges. When I watch the video camera of the body or look through the microscope, or know that I am breathing in and sitting. Who or what is watching, looking, knowing? Is it the mind, the same mind that I can also watch thinking? Basically, it's uh, our consciousness. It's the consciousness that's watching. I mean, you're watching me, right? But your eyes are only receiving color and form in a certain shape. It's your mind that is identifying that as Bhantarabhuda, perhaps, or uh, whatever, either liking or not liking. Or, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the sense of the ego is the one who's seen. But, when you reach a state of that concentration that I've already been mentioning earlier, about when you become the empty house or the ice cube melting, then the eye vanishes and it's, it's awareness that sees and knows. <clears throat> so basically, but, it, but it's basically consciousness because that's what likes the world, you know, the whole world would be dead without conscious beings. I mean, the physical world might be here, but you know, there, there wouldn't be any light, conscious, sentient light. So it's that, that consciousness is watching, but it can be the ego-dominated consciousness, or it can be a more expanded consciousness that's no longer contracted behind your eyeballs. It's been expanded. It's sort of like there was a movie camera just behind your head taking a movie. And actually, when you develop awareness to a very high degree, it's almost like that. It's just like you're watching your body walking in a movie. And like, you know, you, and that the awareness was not inside of it, behind your eyeball. And you may have that experience sometime if you practice that slow motion walking long enough for several hours non-stop, you might be able to enter that state. Because that's the, the natural state of our awareness, but we, we've conditioned it and polluted it with all of our uh, ego-dominated uh, greed, hatred, and delusions and other uh, conditionings that it's, you know, it's blocked it out.
you know, a person who attains full enlightenment would be in that permanent state like that. If people as they advance through different degrees, they will have different degrees of it because just like anything else, these lights, you can dim it you know, very dim when you, you turn it right and it gets a little brighter and a little brighter and a little, you know, four or five stages of brightness. So the same way when the mind, when the pollutions of the mind get worn away more and more and more, the mind gets re retains its natural uh, state of liberated awareness. That's all. But until then, we can get glimpses of that in, in your meditations and these insights and things like that. But, you know, for most, it opens and closes because it's, you know, we spent millions of lifetimes conditioning our mind. And so it may take many lifetimes of practice to clear it all up. And that's why somebody who attains stream entry, they've only eliminated three of those seven fetters. And it may take up to six more lifetimes or seven more lifetimes to finish the work, to reach the final enlightenment. That shows you how deeply embedded ignorance, greed, and delusion is uh, in the mind. Well, sitting, I feel constantly bombarded with unpleasant body sensations and mental repressions of them, along with self-criticism for all that, needless to say, a lot of tension in the body. Please advise. You don't want to hear my advice. <laughs> practice, 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 practice. The reason why you feel sensations in the body, so many unpleasant ones, is because your body is not conditioned properly. You're not sitting in a perfectly straight posture. Your muscles and joints are stiff. The energy is not flowing. You're not breathing in enough oxygen. Fully charge up all the cells. So you have to understand how these different things occur. And when there's so many unpleasant sensations, it's naturally going to affect the mind. So that, that's why the right understanding and knowing the nature of the body and mind and the things that affect it is important. A lot of people say, oh, I just want to meditate. I just want to meditate. And sit down. You, know, and, you know, they don't get very far. Because they haven't done the homework. You know, the preparation. It becomes more difficult than it should be. And then also, it's not only the physical body, but even our mind creates lots of pains, our, our thoughts, our worries, fears, other, you know, uh, things going on in our mind, and, you know, stress. That also affects the body, that can create pains just by that alone. Not necessarily being some injury. Best tips or advice for lay Buddhists? If I could go back and do it again, yeah. if, 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 if. <laughs> I would just start where you are and go forward. And even though it's painful and difficult, you know, 
the old saying, there's no pain without gain. And it's absolutely true. But these modern Westerners are so pain intolerant. You know, they're always seeking for more comfort, more comfort, just like your cat. They're always searching for the softest bed in the house, right? So we're always seeking that comfort, more tasty food, pleasant things to hear. And of course, you know, furniture, wanting bigger and softer and the seats and beds. And, and then the slightest little pain, you know, change. Instead of enduring it, change, take, uh, you know, medicine or pills. So what do you expect? That's why you have to have courage. It takes courage to meditate. Courage to face all the stuff that we've programmed into our bodies and minds for so many uh, years. But it will, it will change if you give it time. But it needs patience and it needs right understanding and following the dumb, like the, the four paths. You have to understand about karma and practice the, the precepts, follow, live in harmony with the laws of nature. Know the kind of things that are harmful for the mind and body and, and you know, overcome them. Of course, the problem is these days there's so many different philosophies and all kinds of new age things and people are inventing new things saying, oh, this is the miracle pill, do this for seven days and you get enlightenment. And, Okay, you know, people are confused. That's why it's better to stick to something that's been around for 2,000 years. Like the dumb. Rather than following some religious cult figure that promises whatever they promise and then tells everybody to drink cyanide and kill themselves. Or so many other things. If you remember old Jimmy Jones back in the 80s or so. <clears throat> Do I sound like a preacher? <laughs> Sorry. If someone is intent on purifying their karma and never being reborn again into this world, what must they do differently than others? Isn't that obvious by now? First of all, don't have this idea that you, on thinking you're going to attain full enlightenment in this lifetime. Probably you're not. But you can at least enter the stream, or perhaps once you turn it, which is not too bad. You got seven lifetimes, you got one lifetime. Out of the millions that we've already spent revolving through sansara, seven more lifetimes, and that was only if you're very negligent that most people could attain uh, even all four stages in one life if they had the previous good karma that got them born with the, uh, you know, the paramis and, and, the, and the, you know, good karma. Um, Well, I understand the goal is not to have negative thoughts. How is this possible given the horrid atrocities in the world? Because people think this world should be all peaceful. That's a bunch of baloney. Who said? The world of human beings was not made to be peaceful because it hasn't been peaceful from day one. Read the Bible, even. 
Even in the Buddhist day, people have been killing in wars. They don't think that this world is horrible and polluted. It's the way it is. And you don't have to be a part of it if you don't want to be. I mean, I went to Sri Lanka when I was just, you know, 26 years old. And that was, you know, back in the early 70s. And, you know, I, I've already mentioned, you know, I lived in a cave and had a, you know, ideal, perfect kind of monk life. I could have stayed there the rest of my life and basically just forgot about the world. Living on a hilltop right by the Indian Ocean where the waves were breaking on the, on the, on the rocks. And all I could hear was the sound of the, the surf and the powerful nature. I could just you know, walk a mile away and people would give me food and come back and just meditate to my delight. Get out in the morning at sunrise, do yoga. Not have to do anything else. I could have done it. But, you know, I came back. Uh, but uh, anyway, I don't know how I got off onto that. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these questions I prefer not to answer. Some of these questions are really complicated. Why do we have an ego? Well, you know, the ego is not necessarily the enemy. It's an untamed ego. One that, you know, you know, is full of itself, you know, is taking it to be real and then using it to have power over others or to, you know, use it to, you know, gain riches and fame and whatever. But you can have a positive ego. First, the person has to get, get a positive ego. To have a goal, like to become a, a Buddha. Or the goal of wanting to improve oneself. Okay, it's the ego that wants to improve, but that's not going to hurt others. And so we have to use the ego in a positive way in order to eventually be able to let it go. With this idea, oh, you have to kill the ego, have to kill the ego. No, 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 that's dangerous. You have to know how the ego came about and you have to remove the food. You know, just like, uh, you know, don't, not feeding a stray dog. But we keep feeding our ego. Oh, I want this, I want this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's desire, restrain it. Like if you stop feeding a stray dog, eventually it'll keep coming back a few times, but then he'll say, this person's useless, there's no food here, and go away. So the same way, when you, when you uh, practice the precepts, that's the way you restrain the ego. Because it's the ego that wants to tell lies, to steal things, to kill people out of anger, or to you know, rape, pillage, and plunder. Or intoxicate the mind or get drunk to get high because they're feeling suffering. You know, it's the ego that does that. 
because it's it doesn't know any other way out. But the Buddha gave us a way out that doesn't cause harm to others. And that is this kind of, you know, the Eightfold Path, but especially the practice of meditation. You have to go back. How did the ego get started in the baby? As I was explaining, it reversed the course. The baby started, you know, getting addicted to pleasure and wanting to get away from pain. And so this started thinking about the future. How can I get more pleasurable feelings in the future? How can I keep these uh, painful feelings away from the past? So, by keeping the mind in the middle and developing present moment awareness, which is the natural state of the consciousness, that, that's, that's the way it's done. By following the four foundations of mindfulness. Besides meditation, what are other practices for increasing concentration? Play a game of chess. And yes, play your guitar. And people say that's the meditation. You know, there's different kinds of concentration. People call all kinds of things. This is mindfulness. This is concentration. But it may be a, an ordinary type of concentration, but it's not called right concentration. The, the Buddhist teaching all the steps of the Eightfold Path are called right understanding as opposed to wrong understanding, right thought as opposed to wrong thoughts, right mindfulness as opposed to just ordinary mindfulness, right concentration as opposed to, I mean, a, a cat can concentrate watching a mouse. We have a cat at our meditation center. <laughs> we see him outside, fully concentrated on watching a you know, something crawl around. But that's not right concentration. Where a thief can have mindfulness, he'll tiptoe and be aware of not making noises and he's trying to break into a house. But that's wrong mindfulness. Mm. Okay, friends, let's see. If I didn't answer your question, don't be offended. But uh, about enlightenment and so on. Just keep practicing the eightfold path. Yes. Why didn't you stay in Sri Lanka? Why didn't I stay? Out of compassion for one thing for my mother who was horrified that I was living in that kingdom with mouse licking my toe at night and <laughs> monkey ceasing me. Uh, no, but because the Dhamma was now coming to America. And I heard about this place actually. And this when Bhante G was uh, just starting the Bhavan Society and they, they bought some land and they were asking for people to, to come and help. So even since I became a monk, I thought that someday when I felt I was ready, I would, you know, come back. But when I left the States, there was no Dhamma around that time. 1972, hardly any Dhamma at all. No meditation center here. Uh, and so, but by, you know, the 80s, you know, Dhamma, you know, have been you know, coming. So many Westerners coming back from Thailand, Sri Lanka, and like uh, Insight Meditation Society, Barry, Massachusetts, and Goinka was coming, and you know all the. So you know, it started to, and so I, I felt uh, you know, now maybe we did that, and I wanted to, you know, if I could help to share some of my experience, my energy to start a forest monastery. It was basically a forest monastery that I was 
hoping one day it would, would start there because that's where I lived with forest monasteries in Sri Lanka. And that's why when I came here, it was, you know, some of my influence can be seen uh, from my my own experience, like all the different cooties out in the forest and, and things like that. Anyway. I saw a hand shoot up in the air back there. I don't know. You know one last question. Is there a kind of difference between unintentional killings and intentional? And you mentioned the insects, um, referring to roadkills like squirrels and deer that are no. bent over by cars and driving. That, that's a good question, yes. Karma is intentional action. So that if you unintentionally, there wasn't any intention or desire to kill, but there's by some accident or so on, something was killed, then it's not a, a complete karmic action. Such as, you know, if you're walking through the forest and there might be insects underneath, you know, all the leaves and other things, and maybe you're walking through, you had no idea, your intention wasn't to go out and stomp on ants or anything, but maybe one or two got killed. Or in doing something else, I mean, it's very similar to Western law. Right? Premeditated murder gets you life in prison or the death penalty. Second degree murder, which is like uh, unplanned, but it happened, maybe you got in a fight and accidentally <clears throat> somebody fell and cracked their skull and died. But your intention wasn't to kill them. So the, the sentence is less. And then even involuntary manslaughter, the sentence is even less. Reckless homicide, the sentence is even less. And it's all based on the intention behind it. So therefore, if you, you know, things are killed inadvertently when you're doing work and this and that, uh, you know, you might feel bad about it, but, you know, from the uh, strict karmic point of view, it's, uh, you know, it was done in an intention. So there still can be some retribution. Look, you may not intentionally to kill somebody. You go, you get drunk and you go driving your car. Your intention is to kill somebody, but because you might, if you got in an accident, their family is not going <laughs> to forgive you for that, right? <laughs> They're going to want to, you know, get you take retribution. So just because. In the law, uh, unintentionally, you didn't do something. It doesn't mean there's not going to be any effects from other people wanting to, you know, get at you. That's just what it is. Okay. And so, uh, so <clears throat> why don't you go ahead and uh, stand up and stretch your legs a bit and then and actually we're going to start this evening meditation <clears throat> by reciting the Marana Sati which is the, uh, the traditional uh, contemplation of, of death uh, and I'm going to just uh, recite it, uh, and you can listen to those verses and kind of you know, contemplate them as the start of the, the meditation. I'll just do some three-part breathing. I want to do a little walking on the side, kind of just to loosen up your legs to relieve and Pain from sitting for an hour.
when you lay that deep our breathing, and you used to gradually be able to when you train your breathing, you be able to breathe in even for longer breath, to hold the breath a little longer, and so on. It takes time to gradually train the lung muscles and so on. Stretches. Remember. That bending with both arms and 
Ananda will proceed right to left and remove out breath to the right, drive focus on the hand going back. In breath, back to the front. Let your feet turn with the body, the other side. In. In Just breathe in, hands over the head. The outward hands to the chest, bend the knees, lower down, keep your back upright. Really stretch your knees and hips. In breath, all the way up.
Head turning from right to left. Finish the backward and forward bending before I try to keep the edges of your hands back in the fingers straight. The in breath with the hands up. Let's spread the arms apart, you breathe out and bend back. In breath, out breath. Then we stretch and keep your legs straight. Keep the little bones in the lower spine stretch out. Begin lifting up. In breath. more Go the downward stretch longer. <laughs> In breath and from the chest.
please uh, dim those down. And now to the mark again. I'm going to make sure I can read this thing. I'm going to just sit there and get your meditation. Just do some gentle three part breathing and it's kind of, I'm going to be chanting the Pali and then the English meaning of each verse. Get focused in the body, breathing body. <clears throat> Avakta Deepa Tulyaya Sayu Santa Kiyakayam Parupamaya Sampasam Bhavaye Maranasatim Like a flame blown out by the wind this life continuum goes to destruction, recognizing one's similarities to others. One should develop mindfulness of death. Maha Sampati Sampata Yata Sata Mata Ida Tata Aham Sami just as people who have achieved great success in the world have died, so too I must certainly die. Death is harassing me. Upatiyasa evedam maranam agatam sada Maranataya okasam vadakoviya isati. Death always comes along together with birth, searching for an opportunity like a murderer out to kill. Not the least bit stoppable, always going forward. Life rushes towards its end, like the rising sun to its setting. Isakam mani vattam tam, satatam gamamusukam, jivitam uraya atam, suryo viyadavati. 
like lightning, a bubble, dewdrops, or a line drawn in the water, life cannot last. Viju bubula usava jalaraji parikayam gatako variputas samata piavario. Death is like a murderer after his foe, completely unrestrainable. Death slays those great in glory, in strength, merit, powers, and wisdom, and even the two kinds of conquerors. No need to speak about one like me. Surya Satama Punidni Buddhi Buddhi Jinadvayam Gate Simaranam Kippam Katumadi Sake Kata. Due to a lack of the necessities of life or to some inner or outer misfortune, I am who am dying moment after moment can die in the blink of an eye. Pachaya nancha vekkalya bahirajatu pandava maramoram nimisapi maramano anukkananti The life of mortals is signless. Its length cannot be known in advance. It is difficult and limited and tied up with suffering. Nahi so upakamo ati yena jata nami yare jaram pipatoa maranam evam dama ipanino. There is no possibility that mortals shall not die. Having reached old age, they die. Such is the nature of living beings. Pala nami vapakanam pato papatana bayam evam jatana mat Chanam nicham maranato bayam. As fruit when ripe has to fall, so all beings live constantly in the fear that they will die. Yata pikumba karasa kata matika bhajana. Sambe bedana paryanta evam machana jivitam. As a potter's earthen jars eventually must all break up, even so does the life of mortals eventually come to an end. Taharaja Mahataja Ye Balaya Pandita Sambe Machu Samyanti Sambe Machu Parayana The young and the old, the foolish and the wise, all move in the grip of death. All finally end in death. Anicca vata sankara upada vayadamino upacitva nirunjanti desam upasamo suku. Impermanent are all conditioned things affected by rising and falling away. Having arisen, they then must cease. Blissful is it when they subside. 
Achiram Vatayam Kayo Pataving Adisesati Chudo Apitta Vinyano Nirattam Vakalingaram Alas, before long this body will lie cast away upon the ground bereft of all consciousness, like a senseless block of wood. Anamito tato aga nanyunato ito gato yato gato tata gato tata kapari devana Uninvited, he came here. Without leave, he departed. He went just as he came, so why lament?
When you're ready, take your rest. After standing up, I stand at least just for one minute before rushing to the future. <laughs> 